Uh, I'm the head of security at Pinterest. Been there for uh, uh, pretty much five years now. Um, so I got the opportunity to build uh, the uh, security program from scratch as well as the team. I'm usually interested in solving uh, interesting uh, security problems, but uh, I, I focus uh, I think mainly on uh, product, application, and infrastructure. Um, I'm also on Twitter. Uh, that's my Twitter handle, uh, Don't Live Twice. Uh, if you want to uh, engage with me, uh, follow me on Twitter. I'm pretty responsive usually, uh, so that's, I think, a good uh, venue for uh, discussing any security matters. Um, all right, so today we're uh, going to to um, talk about um, how do we secure our uh, high-risk users and uh, what we do to uh, uh, leverage their engagements to improve account security. I'll define what a high-risk high user uh, in a subsequent slide. So uh, here's the agenda. Uh, so first, we're going to state the problem we're trying to solve. Uh, we're going to uh, talk about our motivation solving such a problem. Uh, go over the overall design of the solution, um, present uh, uh, results and our findings, uh, what we learned, and then we're going to wrap up with a five uh, minute or 10 minute Q&A session. Uh, all right, so problem statement. Um, so users have many accounts today. I read uh, lately that on average 90 uh, accounts. Uh, so remembering unique credentials for each one uh, of these accounts can be challenging for them. Uh, password managers do work in theory. Uh, however, they can be overwhelming, uh, complex, hard to use for your average user. Uh, their breaches are becoming more and more frequent. Uh, which puts uh, users of shared uh, passwords uh, at even higher risk. Uh, all right, why are we motivated to uh, solve this problem? Well, obviously we take our uh, users' privacy and security very important. Uh, we're trying to be proactive in protecting this, uh, uh, these high, uh, this population of high-risk users. Uh, we're also trying to protect as much as we can while minimizing frictions and uh, yet are still providing great user experience. And uh, of course, we want to leverage their engagement, uh, get them excited, and encourage them to improve their uh, account security and practices. A uh, couple of definitions before we start. Uh, so credentials, uh, in the context of uh, this presentation, uh, credentials is an email password pair. A valid exposed credentials are credentials that appear in a third-party data breach and have been verified to be in use. Uh, a high-risk user or HRU, I'm going to refer to this uh, HRU along the uh, presentation is a user with valid exposed credentials. Uh, cool. Uh, this is the overall design of the system uh, we've built at Pinterest. Uh, so there are mainly, uh, or actually there are uh, four phases uh, to, uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the system. So the uh, very first phase is what we call record, uh, record ingestion. So this is about uh, wh what sources you can use to uh, ingest uh, exposed credentials uh, from vendors, uh, paste bins, and so forth. Um, account matching is uh, the second phase here, and it's about uh, how do you uh, uh, match uh, uh, data in these uh, breaches uh, against users that are your users, right? In other words, uh, you shouldn't care about exposed credentials for users that are not uh, for your service. Uh, third is uh, account tagging. Uh, so this is uh, about tagging these users as high-risk users or higher-risk users than your uh, uh, average user. And finally, uh, we get to the protection phase. And here is how do you protect this high-risk uh, user account, prevent ATOs, abuse, misuse of uh, their account. So next, we're going to dig deeper into each one of these phases, and we'll talk about how we, uh, how we went and uh, what we did and what we implemented. Uh, so record ingestion. Um, so there are a bunch of sources uh, out there. Uh, so I'm going to mention a few here. Uh, so forgive me if I forget some. But uh, the very first one uh, is uh, obviously vendors. You can go through vendors to get access to this data, right? So. Uh, uh, the pros of going through a vendor, uh, usually the data they provide you tends to be reliable, right? Uh, also, uh, it's organized uh, and is in a standardized format. That could be their text, JSON format, uh, which makes it easy to parse and automate. Um, the cons uh, I, I didn't mention here, uh, they're basically, they tend to be expensive 
or you have to pay money, so they're not free. Uh, a few examples uh, for ones that we uh, uh, worked with or evaluated our whole security, Qintel uh, and Shape. Uh, the screenshot here is an example of a dump you would get from uh, such a vendor. As you can see, the format is pretty uh, self-explanatory, I would say, and simple to parse. Uh, you have an email column password or plain text password. Uh, in this case, I believe this is a text format file. Uh, a JSON format would be a similar uh, thing. So the second is what we call pastes. Uh, so these are, uh, so the pros, uh, actually let's start with the cons. <laughs> this is a little bit updated slide. Uh, so the cons, uh, they tend to be unreliable. Uh, there is a lot of uh, duplicated data there. Uh, probably what you find is uh, disorganized. So you need extra verification steps, extra cleanup to get it to, uh, I think, a state where you can use it in production. Uh, uh, of course, the pros, they're free. You don't have to pay for them. Um, uh, you can find also all uh, sort of type of data there, database dumps, email password pairs, random logs, um, session uh, cookies, what have you. So this could be pros and cons. There is a lot of data to play with or uh, uh, look at, but also uh, it requires more effort to, uh, to parse and handle. Uh, examples, uh, pastebin.com, uh, obviously. Uh, I threw in two uh, screenshots in here. Uh, so the first is, I think the format, uh, if I'm reading this correctly, is the URL, um, the login or the email, and then the password of the user. Um, the second screenshot uh, down there is, I think is the domain or the URL, uh, some cookie value, and I believe the cookie name. So uh, it could be challenging going through these, uh, and you, you have to find uh, tune your uh, parsing tools to make sure you're ingesting this data correctly. Uh, other sources uh, out there are uh, threat intel platforms. So these tend to be more, uh, in my experience, for malware analysis, uh, spam, uh, IP uh, reputation, uh, bad known proxies. A uh, few examples, threat exchange from Facebook or OTX from Alien Vault. Uh, other random sources, uh, reporters can reach out to you, underground forums, uh, dark web services and markets. Uh, an example here from someone who reached out to me sometime uh, back, I believe he was a reporter, uh, claiming that he has access to Pinterest login credentials. So I think, yeah, it's, it's valuable to follow with these guys if you have the right bandwidth, the right team size, else I, I, I think uh, it requires a lot of effort to verify. Uh, cool. So the next step is, uh, or the next phase in that uh, big diagram I showed uh, uh, first is what we call account matching. So there are th three steps here, right? So the very first step is downloading your uh, uh, DB users or have a dump of uh, your DB users. So what you want is uh, you want um, basically to work uh, with a snapshot. You don't want to work with the DB uh, live in production. So uh, that comes with a price. So you're now dumping your uh, uh, DB users. So uh, obviously there is a lot of sensitive information in there. So make sure uh, whatever system you've built is uh, secure end to end. Uh, for example, if you're using uh, an S3 bucket to dump this data in, make sure you have the right uh, lifecycle policy, uh, retention policy in there. Uh, also make sure you use uh, IAM or identity access management uh, policies uh, correctly uh, to uh, only allow access to your uh, uh, matching service and not others. Uh, similarly, uh, make sure the instances where your uh, matching service is running are basically secure. Think about securing SSH access. Uh, think about uh, securing your network configs, your OS configs, and also have um, monitoring uh, logging in place to detect any suspicious activity in these boxes. Because uh, again, they have like sensitive data. Um, so, um, talked about all this. Um, oh, uh, as far as uh, I think uh, the frequency of these dumps, right? How frequently you should dump or how, how frequently you should have a dump of your users to work with? Uh, well, uh, this could be weekly, could be daily, monthly, yearly. And uh, the thing here is the more frequent they are, the fresher the data is. Because uh, think about if you have a fresher dump to work with, you'll have uh, a fresher list of your users, also a, a fresher list of their uh, uh, passwords or 
whatever uh, cryptographic uh, function you use to store their passwords, right? Uh, for us, uh, we do this every three days. Don't ask me why, but that's <laughs> what we picked. Uh, as far as the format of these dumps, at a minimum, uh, I think you will require user ID, email, and a bcrypted uh, and the bcrypted passwords. So. You can use other cryptographically secure functions uh, to store your passwords, up to you. But at, 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 at the very minimum, these are the three, uh, I think, uh, fields you know in your uh, DB dump. Uh, the second step of the account matching is what we call uh, combining accounts. Or this is, uh, I, w I would like to call this like the validation step. So the idea here, as I mentioned earlier, is to basically only look for uh, uh, accounts that uh, match your users, right? So how do you do that uh, email-based matching? So you only grab uh, records or exposed credentials for users that are your users or Pinterest users, right? Uh, and the idea is like, you, you don't want this extra responsibility of dealing with exposed credential from other services. Uh, so once you have um, that, uh, that list, you'll end up with uh, something uh, as you can see in this uh, screenshot. So basically, you will have this intermediate file that uh, you'll process at a later time where uh, you have the email of the user, the user ID, bcrypted password, and then the plain text password from the, uh, uh, from the data, the data breach dump you had or the uh, exposed credentials. Uh, so once you end up with this list, uh, comes the validation step. So uh, the validation step is about recomputing in our case, the bcrypt out of the plain text password, make sure they match, right? And then only then, if there is a match, you basically add that user ID to the list that you want to tag later on, right? Because you, you, you don't want to just randomly grab records. So if the password is wrong, then there is no point of protecting that user or locking them out. It's just not smart. It doesn't provide a good user experience. Uh, this is a great example of uh, why this is important. So if you can see here, there is this account uh, share at or c-h-e-r at t-online.de, you can see that when we did the matching phase, we ended up with three passwords here. So cryptographically speaking, at most only one will be like valid, right? So if there is at most one uh, uh, valid comparison, then we add it to the list, or it could be none, right? So in that case, we disregard and we move on. Um, the final step in account matching is uploading uh, this list of user IDs that matched and proved to be uh, to have valid exposed credentials. So uh, what you want is um, uh, you only want the user IDs in there. So no more emails, uh, no more uh, bcrypted password, what have you. Uh, user IDs is enough uh, to uh, to go to the next step of the process. Um, also, don't forget to delete your uh, list of uh, uh, initial list of accounts you downloaded or your DB dump because you're now uh, done processing and you don't want it lingering around. Um, cool. Uh, account tagging. So now you ended up with these list uh, of files with user IDs in them, right? So uh, what are the challenges uh, for account tagging? Well, uh, the two challenges we faced. Uh, where that we ended up with a large uh, number of files to process, and then we also had like a lot of records or user IDs per file. This is uh, typically the case if you have never gone through this exercise before, and this is the very first time you're trying to get at it, right? Because most likely, since you've never done it before, most likely you will find a lot of matches, a lot of users will fall as HRUs or high-risk users, and that's because of, again, the problem statement, people tend to reuse credentials across services, right? So, um, so what was our solution to, uh, uh, to basically overcome these challenges? Well, uh, we decided that uh, we'll have a periodic uh, nightly uh, tagging job. So this is an asynchronous job that runs nightly and basically process files as it runs and then leaves some to the day after or what have you. Uh, I mentioned pin later here, that's uh, actually our open source uh, solution for um, managing and executing a synchronous job. Go to uh, GitHub if you're interested. Uh, actually, that's, that's what we use internally. And the snapshot here or the screenshot is, shows the different runs for, of our um, uh, job tagging. Um, 
uh, and you can see here they run pretty much every day. I don't think you can see it uh, in this slide, but 9 p.m. is uh, the runtime. Uh, also, uh, we found it helpful to adopt a slave uh, or a master slave uh, type architecture. Uh, so uh, basically your master job will go and list or uh, have a list of all these files to be processed, um, filter out any already processed files, let's say from the previous run, and then also you can use it as a reporting mechanism to report on the total, uh, total number of uh, files you process and the accounts you tagged. Uh, your slave job, uh, will, you will have a slave job per file, right? Uh, for each uh, account in the file, your slave job will grab your user object through your user service or uh, by talking to your DB, depending on your uh, implementation, and then will mark uh, that user at this point as HRU user. Uh, one thing here to look for is to uh, not use a Boolean flag, rather use a Unix timestamp. And uh, I think this is really important because you want to account for password changes, right? Or any account uh, change that the user has made. Example, if you're tagging this user as high risk user today, uh, not today, at some point in time based on the timestamp, however they change their password later on, then that exposed credential is no more relevant. So you have to skip. So flag, yes or no, is uh, not sufficient. So you want to keep the timestamp to know uh, whether that's in the past or that's actually current. Um, your slave job will also mark the file as process. process so next time uh, the, the master uh, runs, it basically prunes that out and doesn't process it again. Um, talked about uh, this, all right. Uh, final step uh, or final phase uh, of the solution is account protection. So we'll, uh, we'll talk about two types of protections here. So uh, the first is what we call programmatic protection, and I'll go over what that means. Uh, and the second is um, user engagement based protection, right? Uh, so we use both uh, at Pinterest. So the goal of the pro programmatic protections is uh, to protect as many HRUs or high-risk users while minimizing frictions and providing a great user experience. Uh, so what, what to do to, when, when you protect an account? So you, you want to validate all active sessions. So here again, have like a session valid after field, Unix timestamp, so that any sessions that predate your protection are no more valid and uh, they're actually revoked. Uh, also, you want to have a reset password, recover account link, uh, so you can recover your users. Make sure your recovery flows work. This is uh, something we discovered when we uh, went through this, uh, this exercise and we found like edge cases or bugs in some platforms where users cannot recover their accounts. So if you want to see uh, that user again, make sure you test your recovery flows before you start protecting. Uh, send them an email, let them know what happened. Uh, this is an example of what we do, so basically explain that something suspicious happened, uh, we uh, reset your password, uh, you can see we provide the uh, reset password link in there so that we can recover them. Uh, we also uh, give them advice on how they should choose their password, unique strong password, and then we use this as an opportunity as well to uh, um, encourage them to up-level their security level. So in this example, hey, turn on to two-factor authentication. And we, <clears throat> we actually noticed that uh, these, uh, these users or users who receive such notification are more um, likely to engage with uh, such messages rather than your average user that have never been in this bucket. So it's a good way to kind of upsell uh, them to, uh, to, uh, to go to a higher security level. Uh, when should you protect? Uh, do you protect as soon as possible, as soon as you know this user is a high risk user when you're tagging them, or do you wait till they generate a new login? So we, we, we decided to do it at new login because for a simple reason we believe that if a valid exposed credentials were to be used by a bad guy, they'll end up generating a new login event. So at that point we want to protect. We don't want to just go and protect uh, um, blindly is probably the wrong word, but as soon as we know, because we don't want to affect active sessions if we don't have a proof that that account has been exploited or something bad is happening. So we decided to do it during new login. Now that you do it during new login, so there are two approaches here, right? All right, so we're doing it at new login, but there is an aggressive approach 
and there is a balanced approach. Aggressive approach is basically each time a high-risk user logs in, go and protect the account. A more balanced approach is, all right, I know this is a high-risk user logging in, but let me correlate this with other signals. Do I know the device that generated the login? Uh, what's the reputation of that IP the login is coming from? And if you get the right score there, then you go ahead and protect. So uh, here again, we, uh, we, uh, we opted for the uh, uh, more balanced approach. So I think I talked about this. Uh, all right. So uh, the question now becomes, so if you go with a balanced approach, how do you protect these users that you're uh, leaving on the table, right? So these users that you would have protected with an aggressive approach. Where the answer to that is uh, user engagement uh, based protections. So let's engage with the user and try to get them to secure their account because we weren't 100% sure that they have been exploited, right? So the, I think I said this. Uh, so the benefits here is uh, this reduces noise, right, of your protection systems, avoid invalidating sessions, resulting in logging legit users out. So yes, they're high-risk users, but you don't have enough evidence that has been exploited yet, right? So by engaging with them, and I'll explain how, you can uh, uh, get away from that bad state. Uh, you want to also capture an additional signal provided by the user that, they can, that you can then go and use to enhance the efficiency of your programmatic rules, right? Or your uh, balanced programmatic approach. Uh, and it just provides better experience overall. I think legit users hate that you protect them and actually they're the actual user. That's a terrible user experience and uh, we don't want to be uh, that platform or that service. All right, so what's the solution? How do you do this? How do you engage with your users? Uh, solution is security NACs, right? So this is something that we've built at Pinterest, and uh, uh, here is the idea. So uh, you, you have an HRU user uh, browsing or on your uh, platform with an active session, uh, you go and tell them, hey, uh, I think we saw, or based on our uh, programmatic detections, we, we saw that your credentials might be at use at other services. And present them with options to get out of this unsecure state to a more secure state. And this example uh, here, uh, you're basically uh, encouraging them to change their password. Um, and in which case, if they do, uh, you use or you take opportunity of this flow to uh, uh, force them to choose a strong password. For example, do not allow any uh, passwords that show in any data breach, for instance. That's kind of an aggressive approach. Or do not allow them to choose any passwords that showed in data breaches that match their accounts. Uh, also, uh, you can force uh, all sorts of things because these are users that are engaged and they're willing to up-level their security. So you can have stricter requirement here, or password length needs to be this, or you can do much more than you're just uh, your average user. Uh, the other options here is uh, to link to Facebook or Google. So uh, you can link uh, your account to Pinterest account to Facebook or uh, Google, and in which case, if they chose to do this, we disable password-based logins. So, uh, so that exposed uh, password is uh, no more valid on the platform. Uh, other options we're experimenting with still is uh, encouraging to enable two-factor authentication or FIDO authentication. Uh, this framework can also can also target other population besides uh, HRUs. So you can target your high value accounts, such as advertisers, business accounts, celebrities, creators, influencers. Um, all right, what if the attacker interacts with the security nag instead of the right person? Well, they have zero, uh, uh, pretty much zero incentive to do so because they already are in the account and any action they will take with the security nag will log the legit user out. So we will notify that user that will uh, uh, have uh, uh, they will potentially lose access to their account. You can you can tell me, hey, they can lock that user out. Sure, they can do it without a nag. Also, they can go just through a change password flow. So uh, we don't see any risks 
uh, adding this uh, nagin there. Uh, okay, results and what we learned. So programmatic protection. Um, so again, uh, correlation is so important to reduce noise. Uh, you can see in the graph here uh, the raw signal, uh, which is green, or this is the aggressive approach I mentioned uh, in, a, in a previous slide, uh, is when simply an HRU logs in. Uh, the correlated signal, or red, is more the balanced approach, is when uh, the login is for an HRU plus from an untrusted device. How would you find a trusted device? We use a combination of different inputs, such as IPs, sessions, and computer risk factor. Uh, the correlated signal means we are highly confident the account has been taken over, and we can do the uh, protection programmatically at that point. Uh, here is a graph of how many HRUs we protect programmatically, and this is a daily graph. You can see that like, uh, it, it depends the day. Uh, uh, there are different uh, uh, number of protections, but uh, on average, we protect uh, uh, 5,500 HRUs daily, which amounts to 170,000 uh, users or HRUs per month. Uh, also, tip here, uh, the spikes you see, th you can use these as uh, uh, alerts to uh, signal an active uh, ATO or an account takeover attacks. Uh, user engagement. So, uh, so we know we, we learned that most users uh, secure their accounts by changing their password, or they interact with the NAG by clicking on the change password bar, uh, followed by linking to Google and then linking to Facebook by the numbers. Uh, so, uh, password based uh, uh, are around twelve hundred. Uh, Google a thousand. These are all data, and then Facebook 900. Uh, we also saw that there is 20% engagement rate with uh, the NAG we present them with. This means like one out of five uh, users or HRU users that have been presented with the NAG, they did take an action and chose to secure their accounts. Uh, on average, uh, the user-based engagement protects uh, 3,100 uh, HRUs uh, daily, which amounts to uh, 96 thousand per month. Together, programmatic and uh, user-based engagement amount to uh, 266,000 uh, protections per month. All right, uh, let's summarize. So, ingest data from vendors, base, other sources. Uh, look for accounts that match yours. Don't care about exposed data from other services. Uh, validate means recompute, bcrypts, compare, upload your matches. Uh, tag your accounts as HRUs. Use Unix timestamp instead of uh, a Boolean flag to signal credentials leak. Uh, take, in, uh, take into account any uh, changes that happen to the account, uh, such as password changes, turning on 2FA. Uh, implement both programmatic and user engagement based protections. As we, uh, as we saw today, they're pretty impactful and they work together. Uh, lessons learned, data, data breaches are increasing, will continue to happen. Uh, third par party data breaches affect your users, so don't be innocent, don't say this is not my problem, it's some other services problem. Users uh, share passwords across services, so data, a third party data breach will end up being your own problem. If you are a user, don't reuse passwords across sites, obvious. Use a password manager, yeah, it's also efficient against phishing. I'm not going to talk much about that today, but uh, very efficient. Enable 2FA for sensitive uh, accounts you have. If you are on the security team, perform proactive password matching, secure your user's account. Uh, find creative ways to motivate your users to improve their account security. I think that's it. Yeah. So are you doing any proactive? So we only care about users who are currently uh, our users or users of our platform. So if there isn't an email match on our user database, we just skip. We don't keep these. Uh, yeah, uh, so ha have I been, uh, Poem is uh, a little bit different. It basically takes an email address and it tells you if uh, that happened in uh, a breach or not. So and they don't provide an API, to my knowledge, so that's something that we can't work with. But we're exploring other vendors. We're trying to gather more uh, records because, uh, again, uh, I think based on the impact of this work or this solution, uh, this uh, actually uh, gave us more motivation to go and even do more. Yeah. 
so yeah, thank you. Great question. Uh, so, so I think the 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 problem of bar, uh, bot accounts is uh, uh, is a hard to solve problem, and uh, ATOs uh, is one venue to get you to uh, bot accounts. There are others such as brute forcing attacks or uh, such as farmed accounts. So these are basically fake accounts that an attacker would uh, uh, kind of farm and grow over time. They look identical to your legit uh, accounts and then they use them to do uh, you know, whatever spam attacks they want. Um, so in the context of ATOs here, yes, we do use the signal. We enhance other signals for bot detection with whether the user is HRU or not. Um, we also uh, have other solutions uh, that I didn't go over today, which is fingerprinting of the device, uh, fingerprinting of the browser, and uh, we have rules in place or a rule engine in place to uh, uh, detect whether this is, there is a human behind the device or this is more of a scripted slash bot uh, type activity. It's a hard problem to solve. We're doing a lot. <laughs> and uh, we've seen a lot of improvement, but again, uh, a lot of work is still to be done. Uh, and that's great. And I think I mentioned uh, in the interacting with the NAG when they change their password, that is something we currently do internally, but we're definitely exploring other uh, uh, Intel sources we can use or other solutions such as have I been pwned uh, to, to do uh, that enforcement at that time. Because we can do it or we can allow ourselves to do it for these high risk users. Uh, I think for the general population of users, uh, I think that's a, a, a harder discussion because, uh, again, I think it takes uh, uh, time. It adds extra steps in the sign-up flow and uh, a bunch of these things. So, yeah, I think uh, I think I wrapped up. <laughs> cool.